hopefully getting stuff out. We'll find out the Commonwealth of Learning. Thank you to the Commonwealth of Learning for their funding support, particularly for the Wiki Educator platform, which uh, they've generously been able to provide support for over time, so we appreciate that. Um, BC Campus for the OER Thought Leadership, they're hosting the Scope Seminars to support their planning and technical support for the meeting. Again, really important <coughs> support um, from the global leader in, in this uh, project, in this area. Um, particular thanks to uh, uh, Professor Jim Taylor, Jim over there, for Jim's work. Jim and Wayne and I and Rory have teleconferences on a regular basis and uh, discuss, you know, as we go forward, progress and, you know, getting things focused and pulling all the information together, which we've been doing uh, over some time. So Jim's <coughs> got uh, uh, really good in that. Rory's advice also. Uh, Rory, uh, Professor Rory will be here, I'm sure you will know, when he's got a cold chair and OER at the Desk University, Rory's input and work, uh, both on the Foundation and our Foundation board, and also in the development of this project. It's been great. And of course, we also have to uh, acknowledge the Hewitt Foundation for their funding, and the uh, Foundation have been significant funding partners now for the last two years. And of course, we hope in the future, but we'll uh, also do it. Now, we've got a pretty tight timeline to achieve our outcomes over the next two days. And it's quite important, I think, that we just uh, think about some process issues as we're going forward. Um, we've got the streaming, so we've got um, timetables, you know, we've got fixed points in time when we're sending stuff out around the world where people have expectations about that and being able to log and engage and provide feedback and stuff. So we don't really want to necessarily get too distracted in terms of our time management. So a suggestion uh, might be that what we do is as we go through the discussions and presentations and feedback sessions, it might be better if we focus our attentions on the key issues, particularly things like things we see as being perhaps showstoppers or really key issues that are things that we're going to have to resolve. I'm not suggesting by any stretch of imagination we're going to resolve them in the next two days, but what we need to do is get them, get them recorded. If there are things that are out left field, um, we can stick them up on the parking lot um, so we can even catch and get them recorded. Um, I don't think there's a, a particularly useful of our time to to necessarily have to agree on all of the stuff here that takes quite a lot of time and, and discussion. Whereas if we really focus on the key issues going forward, then we can work on our action plans as we get to that uh, towards the end of tomorrow. Uh, we'll have you know, some real focus around the action plans that we're going to have and then the teams uh, and participants who will work on those over time. So if we can kind of stick to that type of thinking, I think that will be quite, quite helpful. Um, so just... Um, Finally, um, our key objectives, and I should have had these up on the over here, and perhaps I'll write them and put them on the wall or something. But firstly, the first major objective we're trying to achieve, basically what we're trying to do in the first instance is select and agree on the inaugural credentials for the OERU. What are the inaugural credentials that we're going to, to, to work with to get in place for pilot to start to, to do this thing? Um, then the next objective would be um, putting a planning process around the prototype and actually selecting some initial courses that will fit to that prediction. We're not talking, you know, to solving the whole world's problems here in one go. We're just starting small, choose a prediction, choose some courses. Um, you'll have thoughts that you've um, had over the, over the last few months about perhaps a course or courses that you think might be suitable. So just thinking about that, choosing a select number and getting the um, thing moving and then we can work through you know, get issues and technical problems and get the model, um, you know, really robust. Um, clearly, we need to think about an official launch of the OER group. You know, we've got product, we've got some courses, and we need to launch it at some point in time, so we think about when that might be. And then the other um, thing that we need to also think seriously about is exploring proposals for strategic investment and, and in what ways can we draw together our networks, our expertise, and uh, garnering some strategic investments and, and projects that will ensure the success, success of the model in the field. Um, other than that, that's my, um, my introduction. So welcome to the sessions and I look forward to uh, today and tomorrow. Pretty exciting times, I think. Um, what I thought would be helpful now is for us to go around the room uh, and introduce ourselves or yourselves 
when you can suggest it as we introduced who you are, where you're from, and perhaps one one key thing. You know, one key thing for you in this, this whole scope of you know what we're here for. Okay? Reasonable? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm Talit Rising, uh, principal of an undergraduate college in the University of Delhi. Uh, I've been with Wiki Educator almost since the beginning, and uh, I've been instrumental in trying to promote OER in India. And we have pre created an India chapter of the OER of Wiki Educator. So I, I'm, I'm here because of my personal commitment and the commitment on behalf of the college that we will contribute to OER content development and in anything else that you want us to do in India or maybe even in South Asia. Hi, uh, I'm Narayan Gaishna, uh, Pro Vice Chancellor of University of South Africa. I've uh, been appointed in this position since the beginning of the year. Uh, prior to that, I uh, was the Vice Principal for Strategy, Planning and Partnerships. Uh, in that position, I was uh, quite centrally involved in shaping the new identity and the <coughs> institution, as well as the university social justice mission. And in this particular role, uh, I've been a strong advocate for open education resources. And as, as a result of that, the Vice Chancellor assigned the responsibility to me. Close to the beginning of the year. One of the first things I've introduced uh, in that role is uh, the policy change in all publications, all new publications, uh, uh, because we need to suppress a tense number of uh, academic publications. I mean, <coughs> the new, uh, new um, policy position we have is uh, that anything that's uh, in print uh, after a year. That would be put into an open education resource repository would be a set of the, uh, the authors. And that's one favor on a lot of the, the new authors. And uh, for those books that are print, uh, we are negotiating a lot of the authors to place all the others into the, the open education repository. Uh, aside from that, I've uh, also obviously uh, initiated a, uh, a series of signature courses, one per college. The idea is that that can be a uh, kind of prototype for how you can develop really context relevant and responsive uh, courses that uh, help develop the skills and capabilities that are required to the college participants for the college. At the same time, give students a very distinctive set of uh, learning outcomes that help them stand out for the community to the general society. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt, and thank you for the rich responses. I'm, I'm just concerned about the timing with, because we have a bit of a late start. So if this initial introduction, we can just keep short and, and, and focused, because we'll have a number of opportunities to, to reach an engagement. Um, but thank you very much. I, it's just the time and the late start. I'm you know, just a bit concerned that we're going to get finished for our international folk. Thank you. Um, Rory McGrail, I'm the UNESCO Commonwealth of Women Chair in Open Education Resources. And my role is to promote open education resources. Uh, institutionally, nationally, and internationally. Uh, Jim Taylor from the University of Southern Queensland, and my current role is in corporate projects at the university where I promote uh, institution-wide initiatives and we're particularly interested in OER and the promotion of our Open Access College. I'm Terry Neal from the Open Polytechnic of New Zealand. Um, my role is Flexible Learning Manager External Services, so I provide technical advice to our business development team, plus also lead um, consultancy projects that we get. And uh, we've done some work in the Pacific and also in India, and I think the challenges 
that I see there, this is a very exciting uh, possible solution, plus uh, we have some internal challenges that I'm also excited about OERs and their potential. I'm Ellen Murphy, uh, Director of Online Curriculum at Empire State College. Um, I think what Empire State um, brings to the table is uh, that we have since our inception offered credit by evaluation, prior learning assessment, and individualized degree programs. Um, we just recently finished offering our first MOOC, or MOOC, or however you call it, <laughs> um, and uh, in the process of offering another one, and plan for a third one in the spring, all um, with a focus on, um, huh, am I just not playing? Uh, interdisciplinary studies. Um, thank you. Hi, I'm Vasi Valchiva, I'm the Flexible Learning Manager at North Tech, um, a New Zealand Polytechnic in the far north. Um, I lead um, flexible learning and multimedia design um, team at the Polytech, working closely with um, um, our tutors to design and develop courses that will provide our North communities with opportunities, learning opportunities. As an institution, we are quite committed to providing them with the best possible opportunities to learn, and joining this network will provide us that ability. So we're really excited um, to be part of it. <coughs> Hi, uh, Phil Kerr, I'm CEO at the Otago Polytech. I guess my um, key interest um, right now is about getting this, the whole OER initiative into the mix um, within the New Zealand uh, tertiary um, delivery scene. Um, it's very hard to find anyone that gets it, uh, but we keep um, banging away and uh, slowly doors are starting to open. Thank you. Good morning, uh, my name is Toshiyuki Matsumoto. I'm working in UNESCO office based in Samoa. Uh, this office is responsible for 17 <coughs> countries in the Pacific region. And currently our office is uh, working in the area of uh, teacher education, assessment and monitoring of literacy and numeracy in formal and non-formal education, uh, education for sustainable development and HIV AIDS education. I'm Judith Murray. I'm the Vice President of Open Learning at Thompson Rivers University in Canada, in British Columbia, Canada. And um, we've been doing open education um, for more, almost 35 years now, open and distance education. And we're looking at, at our, in our institution, what is the next evolution of open education. We're really looking for a new model, and we see open educational resources as very much a part of um, the new model for open education. So that's why we're interested. Kira Koto, Program Belt Kuingua, Noing Rangia Hau, Inane Noho Pahau Ikaki Fakatu, Itewai Punamu. I'm a Director of Planning and Quality at NMIT in the top of the South Island here. Um, I got involved in open learning, I think, way back in 1985. It's nice to get back involved. Um, uh, we're very focused on blended delivery. We have lots of international collaborative exercises where we see this is very useful. But equally, um, we see our partnership with the Tarbo Project as very important and we want to support them as we go forward. Hello, I'm Peter Brook from Tiger Point Technic. I'm here to help with the Australian but also a practitioner around this area. <coughs> Uh, I'm Sandra Wills from the University of Wollongong in Australia. I'm not quite sure where I should be. <laughs> 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 I'm in the middle. Um, uh, Wollongong <coughs> University has um, been active in distance education, but more blended learning for the last two decades, and it's time to reposition ourselves in this new space, the open space. I'm here because we've had a couple of open education activists, Gwen Mitchell and Wendy Myers, who've been running a course in the open um, for this year. So I'm here to formalise their enthusiasm and activism. My name is Frances Ferreira. I'm here presenting the Commonwealth of Learning. I'm one of the eight education specialists. Commonwealth of Learning is actively involved in promoting uh, OERs and we are supporting policy advocacy and awareness by in this regard. We are happy to work. I'm Roman DeBreeze, the Director of Instructional Design at Thompson Rivers University of Open Learning, and uh, I've worked in open and distance learning pretty much all of my uh, working life. And I uh, feel very committed to the goals and objectives of this whole enterprise. Uh, and I think it's a huge learning opportunity in terms of what we can learn 
from exploring these avenues in terms of transforming our own education practices and becoming more open. Hi, my name is Edward Thomas. I'm the Electronic Learning Media Team Leader at the University of Canterbury. Um, the reason why I'm here is because my colleague and I are the activists on our campus. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Nikki Davis, University of Canterbury, Kiora Kunta, uh, and uh, we're just north of here on the same island. Um, and uh, I also have a role on the National uh, uh, Tertiary e Learning Reference Group and in teacher education uh, with the Society of IT in teacher education. And in all of those areas, I'm trying to raise awareness of um, OER and OERU and what we can do better together. Um, hi, I'm Kevin Bell. I'm actually from Newcastle, England, but I live and work in Keene, New Hampshire, um, at Southern New Hampshire University, where we've just spun off a semi-autonomous innovation lab. Um, I actually got the um, mission statement this morning, so I can tell you what we already do, um, <laughs> which is news to me. We will disrupt reduce costs and increase access to transformational educational experiences for underserved students. Um, some of the background for that, our board includes Clayton Christensen, whose work I think many of you will have read, and our president has a, a very serious commitment to the social mission of increasing access to education. Hi, my name is Wayne Lankitosh, I'm director of the OER uh, Foundation, and our mission in life is really to help you achieve your strategic objectives through the use of open education approaches. And I'm Jim Fitzler. I'm a software engineer at the OER Foundation and hope to facilitate whatever we can come up with. Thank you very much. We're now going to move into the phase of the anchor, founding anchor partner statements. Um, and we've asked each of our founding anchor partners uh, just to briefly tell us a little bit about the institution, but as in a little bit about the institution. <laughs> One sentence about why you joined the OER Foundation and the OER Tertiary Education Network. And, and a, a quick statement on what you see yourselves as an institution contributing to the OER University initiative in terms of our logic model. And I'm going to be ruthless in terms of timing. You have no more than four minutes. I shall interrupt and pass the next one uh, for, uh, for this statement. And I'll move. Uh, roughly according to alphabetical order, uh, I, I may have my alphabet a little mess, but I'll move roughly according to alphabetical order. And we have to say that the Basque University was simply brilliant in choosing their name to start with an A, because they are always first in everything. So, um, Rory, uh, if, if you could lead us in the uh, opening statements of founding of your partners, your four minutes begins now. Um. Well, at the Basque University is Canada's open university. We have 39,000 uh, students, 70,000 courses, and uh, we're committed to open learning. And so uh, we do have already um, challenge exams in uh, an active R uh, RPL. Um, and uh, so we see this as uh, being uh, part of what we do already. And. Uh, what we're looking at is how we can extend that and, uh, and make it uh, uh, more powerful. And we're looking at uh, um, cost-effective ways of increasing access to learning, uh, both uh, in Canada and abroad. And uh, um, so this is the, um, um, for about 10 years now, we've been, um, I have with some other colleagues, looking at different cost-effective ways and in Canada, cost effectiveness in education departments is a dirty word. And uh, um, we're finally beginning to talk about it. And uh, I think that this is one cost effective way that we can open up access to the very large masses of students who really need the access. And uh, that's why we're in here. Thank you, Rory. And I'm going to invite uh, Judith Murray to speak on behalf of uh, BC Campus, which is based in Canada, Canada. They're not a teaching institution, but uh, Judith is a member of the strategic governing body of BC Campus. So, Judy, on behalf of BC Campus, yes. thank you. Um, so, thank you, Anne. As uh, Wayne has said, I am a member of the Strategic Advisory Council for BC Campus, and they are not a teaching institution. Um, but they are a publicly funded organization in British Columbia that provides shared services 
and infrastructure to all post-secondary institutions in the province. Their expertise is really in creating linkages and uh, facilitating collaboration between and among institutions. They're experienced in the provision of shared services across a number of institutions and with operating an open educational resource repository. Um, they envision being involved in the OER network in terms of providing thought leadership um, to the OER university and assisting through the facilitation of open collaboration and the provision of shared systems. Um, as demonstrated through the two SCOP sessions or scope sessions that have been run by BC Campus to um, help uh, with this particular initiative. So that is the contribution and the expectations of BC Campus. Thank you very much, Judith. Um, I now get to ask Dr. Saviti Singh to, uh, on behalf of BAOU, which is the Open University of Gujarat province in India, um, to relay uh, the opening statement. Unfortunately, they were unable to attend in person, but Saviti will be very grateful for you standing in. Yeah, the Baba Sahib Ambedkar University is in Gujarat, is one of the top five open universities in India. And it runs about 74 courses I mean, uh, in the distance learning mode. And it's the first one to join the uh, OER platform here. And it's planning to study this uh, logic module and be part of this initiative. I mean, they haven't stepped into it in any way, but they have committed themselves to joining this thing. And they think that their own model, which they call an Omkar model, which is a multi-institutional virtual multimedia classroom accessible to millions of students, that model will tie up very well with the OER U uh, model. So hopefully, uh, if they come in, and I hope they guide all the other open universities in India <coughs> into this. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Richard. This is where my alphabet starts confusing me, but I'm actually invite Empire State College from the State University of New York, so I'm never sure whether SUNY needs to go before ESC or that way around. We're so never sure either. <laughs> um, Empire State College is a member of the State University of New York. Um, we're one of, I think, 64 um, colleges and universities in the system. Um, our strength is primarily um, in adult learning, and um, OER University fits with our college mission. Um, I won't read you all the elements of our mission, but, but um, in particular, uh, one of our commitments is to promote social justice, and another is to um, support the individual goals of our students, and to serve students in the public with a high level of courtesy, and to, um, um, to, to serve students where they are. So this fits with our mission. Um, we have, as I mentioned before, uh, a history of credit by evaluation, um, prior learning assessment, and individualized degree programs. So this fits very much with how we already uh, do uh, teaching and learning at Empire State College. <coughs> and we see this as just continuing what we do and, and um, supporting social justice in the world. Thank you. And let's move to, to, uh, to the south and, and to the mainland, and I invite Nelson Marlborough Institute of Technology. Thank you, I'm Graham Bell. Um, NMIT is a, a regional polytechnic, about 3,000 full-time equivalent students. Um, I don't believe organizations of our size uh, can be sustainable with the existing business model. We have a high percentage of adult students and we have very clear targets around blended, blended learning. Um, we are very recent members, we've signed up as gold medal members and therefore I'm recruiting very quickly, very soon for point two FTE to help us take these things forward and I see them, that person promoting OER within MIT in the first place and then we'll work from there. Then we'll work from there. Thank you very much. And incidentally, we are very proud that New Zealand uh, is the first country in the world to achieve a critical mass of partners for the collaboration. And uh, I'd like to invite North Tech uh, for their founding statement. I'm really honoured to represent North Tech here today. Um, similar to uh, Nelson Marlboro, <coughs> Polytechnic, we are a regional polytechnic. We are located in the far north 
which brings the challenges serving a, a population of about 160,000 um, um, but actually having quite dispersed campuses and learning centers with three or four main learning campuses but about up to 60 other learning centers. As an institution we are really committed to provide um, learning opportunities to the community um, and take learning to, to um, where the learners are. Um, we have challenges with providing that cost effectively and it hasn't been a dirty word for us because we are really challenged to, to provide as much as we can with the limited um, capacity and resources of um, our uh, flexible learning team. So becoming a partner and joining this network is a major um, for us. We are seeing um, endless opportunities of what we can do, the, the, the opportunities we can provide to our communities which are so much better than what we can do by ourselves. So we're really excited to be part of this network to be part of inventing and building the future of education together with those capable partners. Thank you. And now, of course, um, New Zealand's leader in open distance learning, the, the Open Polytechnic. Thank you. Um, the, uh, so yeah, the Open Polytechnic <coughs> is New Zealand's specialist provider of open and distance vocational learning um, at tertiary level. So nearly 29,000 students enrolled with us last year studying anything from basic skills through to degree level, um, living throughout New Zealand and some overseas. Three quarters of our students are in the workforce and studying part-time uh, to improve job skills or career development. Uh, we often work uh, with partners to support learning um, that's as distant as possible, either because of the needs of the learners or the practical skills component of the vocational courses require us to partner with others. Um, so we supply training and education in conjunction with commercial clients, industry training organisations, schools and other training providers, both in New Zealand and internationally. And the Open Polytechnic began 65 years ago as an organisation that thought differently about teaching and learning to increase access for New Zealand learners. And uh, we've decided to join very recently um, to be part of this group because we believe it will lead innovation and affordable and accessible teaching and learning um, for the immediate future. And uh, as I alluded to, we have some internal challenges in terms of that affordability um, with the traditional distance design and development models that we have and we see OERs as having potential there plus um, want to um, help the the uh, wider social goals of the you know, ONU. And of course it gives me a pleasure to announce the world's first tertiary education institution to adopt a default Creative Commons attribution intellectual property policy. So Phil, uh, on behalf of Otago uh, Otago Polytechnic. <coughs> Thanks Warren. Well, Otago Polytechnic, um, we've got about 6,000 students, 3,600 full-time equivalents. Uh, and we've um, been developing firmly um, our delivery um, on a blended learning model. Um, I think too that um, we're too small to be sustainable into the future. I personally think that New Zealand's um, uh, politic uh, sector is too small to be sustainable into the, the future um, as it's currently configured and as we uh, go about our business. <coughs> Um, Otago Polytechnic has um, been long involved in, and I think can rightly claim a, a leadership um, position in assessment of prior learning here in New Zealand. Uh, and um, I think that um, it's from that base uh, that um, OER makes some sense. <clears throat> I mentioned before that um, I, I find it frustrating in the sector that a lot of people just don't get what we're talking about with OER, but I'd need to confess that four years ago I didn't get it either um, and I had a couple of sessions with Wayne and uh, all credit to Wayne for his um, clarity of explanation and persuasive powers um, <laughs> that um, we agreed to, um, to establish what then morphed into um, the, um, the foundation here at Otago Polytech. Uh, I, I guess I, I just knew that it was right, um, a very important part of, um, of the Polytech's platform um, is a value of doing the right thing um, and we have a platform of sustainability 
and of course um, open education resources is in a sense the ultimate um, statement in education of sustainability I think uh, and, um, and I think offers that potential for a sustainable um, uh, vocational uh, system in this country as well as all the opportunity that I think we've all recognised uh, for people who need access um, to, um, to further and higher education internationally. Uh, so um, we're, we're in it for I, I think both sets of reasons. Um, I think that um, OER offers us enormous potential um, to be a stronger institution um, to, um, to provide access for um, a lot more uh, learners um, and, and for us to be part of something that can contribute to a, a more sustainable um, delivery of education worldwide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil. And uh, we're now going to move back to the Northern Hemisphere and uh, to an institution that is really forging a leadership role around new methods of uh, the Southern New Hampshire University. And we perfectly share the Secretary of State Christensen on the board, and I hope you can share some of his insights and collaboration. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so at Southern New Hampshire, we grew from an institution that had some limited online for military, uh, now to the state where our online division actually is four times the size of our traditional college. Um, I've served in a couple of positions. I was CAO of the um, online and continuing ed and then um, AVP for learning and development. Um, and I think in those roles I've managed to see the restrictions of the current models. Um, we are piloting open textbooks. We work with flat world knowledge in the states to have an interesting business model. And we're also partnering with the Council for Adult and Experiential Learning. Um, they have a PLA, we call it the State's Prior Learning Assessment Program, um, that we're working with and learning quite a lot from. Um, but <clears throat> another note to Clayton, um, we've realized how difficult it is for an organization to disrupt itself. So with the President's blessing, we've established this um, separate unit to really disrupt, and so the New Hampshire is very supportive of this. There are four of us on the team, and we've been given license to really start looking into these models. So I'm very excited by that. The bandwidth that I have now that I've given up all my operational duties is, is substantial, and I'm really hoping that I can contribute some of that. Um, I have somewhat of a project management background, but I'm also really interested in things like badges and um, competency-based learning, open pedagogy. Um, really looking forward to all these discussions. And uh, staying in the north, uh, moving to another open distance learning pioneer from Canada, um, Thompson Rivers University, and I'm sure Judith would explain why the institution is so unique and special in this space. Uh, yes, so uh, Thompson Rivers University is located in the city of Kamloops, British Columbia, on the west coast of Canada. Uh, we're both a dual mode, so distance and face-to-face -face, um, university, but we're also a dual sector. University. So we offer uh, courses and programming in the trades, vocational, career education, all the way through to university level um, education. And we have built pathways as an institution that allow learners to transfer learning and credits from one level of education to the next without having to repeat. Um, we have more than 25,000 students at Thompson Rivers University, pretty much equally distributed between distance learners and campus learners. Um, and uh, we have uh, students who study with international students who study with us on our campuses as well as um, with our partner institutions around the world. We've had um, almost 35 years of experience in open and uh, distance education. We were the former uh, Open Learning Agency or the British Columbia Open University until the Ministry of British Columbia decided to bring um, this single mode distance institution together with a campus based institution to create Thompson Rivers University. And we very much have benefited from that uh, um, uh, merger. We have adopted in open learning an outcomes based philosophy um, to education, and in that philosophy, we believe that it's our responsibility to articulate the learning outcomes that are required to receive a particular credential or credit. Uh, from our institution. We also believe it's our responsibility to then create the assessment mechanisms that will validate for us that that learning has occurred. In doing that, we have adopted policies and practices that uh, allow for the fact that that learning can happen. There are multiple pathways to achieve that learning, of which prior learning assessment and recognition is just one vehicle for recognizing 
um, that that learning has happened. Once we've validated the learning that has occurred, regardless of the pathway or the modality of learning, we can then credential that learning um, and give credit uh, and credentials for that. Um, we are also very much engaged and have been for a long time in prior learning assessment and recognition. Uh, we have an international research center in prior learning assessment and recognition at Thompson Rivers University. We have eight of the world's eminent scholars and including UNESCO participation in that um, uh, research center and Empire State um, is a participant in that center with us. And uh, we're very much looking forward to, as I say, we've done open and distance and online education for 35 years. We're really looking at what is the next evolution? What is open learning 2.0 or 3.0 look like? And um, how are we going to pioneer that future? We're looking for a new model. Um, we envision contributing in this organization at all levels of the, um, the logic uh, model that's been presented. Our interests, though, are uh, specifically focused on the reuse of open educational resources and in the, uh, recogni the recognition of learning that happens through open educational resources. So thank you for inviting us. Thank you, Judith. And uh, moving down south again, uh, one of our leading uh, research universities, the top 500 uh, university, um, University of Canterbury. Thank you. Uh, university of Canterbury is a research intensive university with its main campus in Christchurch, New Zealand. Established in 1873, uh, the University of Canterbury is ranked, as, as Wayne said, amongst the top 200 with over 100 programs from foundation to doctoral studies and over 150 disciplines from accounting to zoology. As one of the largest providers of teacher education in New Zealand, the College of Education has evolved multiple modes of course offerings, including culturally sensitive, flexible learning options that may be studied from a distance. Um, and the postgraduate diploma of e-learning and digital technologies is particularly relevant, we think, to the Open uh, Education Resources University. We joined just last week <laughs> uh, uh, the OER movement to increase understanding of the co-evolutionary processes of education and digital technologies to counter decreasing equity. Um, we have a new um, phrase in the university since uh, the earthquakes hit us last year, and it's called You Can. Uh, and You Can goes go global with OERU. Uh, we plan uh, to contribute to the OERU uh, logic model led by the e learning lab, which I direct. Uh, we recognize this co evolution. Uh, and uh, that's an area of my research and also <coughs> of my teaching. And with support from my students and um, Herbert and his electronic uh, learning media team, uh, we would like to offer uh, a one of my postgraduate courses um, <coughs> about change with digital technologies in education, because it seems to me that that could help to build capacity uh, <coughs> amongst the consortium. Um, but at the same time, we need to prove the strong quality assurance processes underpinning OERU that are part of its logic model. We think that's our biggest challenge, and I know it's going to be my biggest challenge, because if we can't prove it, I won't be able to stay in. <laughs> and I'm determined to stay in. <laughs> um, the University of Canterbury eLearning Lab has a number of people on joining us online here, and they could doctoral students and teacher educators from Kenya and from Greece, and we're keen together to play uh, a leading role in the, to counter the global education challenges. As I said, you can go global with OERU, recognizing that you can began with the University of Canterbury's students' response to Canterbury earthquakes to serve their community. Thank you. Um, very few people may know this, but I'm going to introduce an outstanding pioneer. The world's first single mode distance teaching university was an African innovation. Uh, and we are very proud to have the University of South Africa join us. And I'd like the University of South Africa to thank for everything I have learned around open learning. I had the privilege of working at UNISA for 12 years, so um, I'd welcome. Uh, UNISA's uh, opening statement. 
Thank you very much, Dave. <coughs> UNISA is uh, one of 23 universities in the South African system. It's the only dedicated distance uh, institution. Uh, it has one third of the publicly funded cohort of students uh, in South Africa. So it's a massive institution uh, with the potential to make a huge impact on economy and society. But also it has the potential to be a spectacular failure if it doesn't work. So the expectations are high. Uh, the university was set up uh, in its reconfigured form. Uh, it was a merge of few institutions in 2004 uh, to form the current mega university. And the brief to the university was to provide access to the formerly disadvantaged primarily. Those at work, uh, those who struggle to get uh, access. Uh, South Africa has a number of urban enclaves with concentrations of universities. So you'll find each of the major cities has four or five universities and then vast tracts of land in between where there are no university opportunities. So as such, uh, UNISA is able to take the higher education opportunity to where students are at. Uh, we operate in online provinces uh, with 30 sites of the WU in total. We have uh, 3,300 uh, course offerings and 600 qualifications. At last count, uh, the student numbers were 375,000. Um, what I think this does is uh, it's, a, it's a daily challenge to uh, develop the systems and the processes, uh, the logistical arrangements to reach our students where they are, where they are uh, to provide them with requisite levels of support. So that by the time they leave UNISA, uh, we are confident that we haven't given them a second grade. Uh, our aspiration has been since the merger in 2004 uh, that we do not want to be we do not want to be evaluated in the South African system uh, differently to the other contact institutions. We want to be subjected to the same quality assurance uh, regimen uh, so that we are able to declare unequivocally that the learning experience at UNISA is no different to that of any contact institution. We're not there yet, but I think that we, uh, we will get there in, in due course. So what, the, what can we need to bring to the table? I think that uh, because we also have about 25,000 students from outside South Africa, most of them on the African continent, uh, we are found in many post-conflict uh, environments, failed uh, states like uh, Zimbabwe, for example, where we have 10,500 students. So UNISA uh, is operating in 14 other African countries, mostly in Anglo Africa. Uh, so we have a network of uh, institutions that we collaborate with and presence in different jurisdictional environments. And we have developed tremendous intelligence in what is required to operate in diverse jurisdictional uh, contexts. Um, aside from that, we uh, we do everything on massive scale. Uh, course enrollments for the largest courses in the region of 22 to 25,000 students. And we have enrollments as few as uh, half a dozen. So that range, uh, it's reaching students in 600 exam centers simultaneously in its exam time. Uh, so logistically, we've also had to develop uh, systems and places to help us reach our students. And then if we are not in the new space at this time of the year, that is because everything is worked spectacularly. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that, aside from that, we, we have uh, a huge repository of uh, open educational resources and we are growing them, as I mentioned earlier on. Um, yeah, uh, so, so it's a it's a university with tremendous experience of uh, doing things on scale, uh, building networks uh, of infrastructure and support for right across the nation and on the continent and even internationally. I think I mentioned that we have students from 50, 50 different countries. So uh, all of that gives us tremendous experience in reaching across borders and taking educational opportunities to get students up.
Moving on to another uh, distance uh, education and open distance learning pioneer at uh, the University of Southern Queensland. And I have to say we are uh, very thankful for the thought leadership we, we have from one of the, the most experienced innovators in higher education, Professor Jim Taylor. So, uh, welcome, Jim. Thanks, uh, Ryan. The University of Southern Queensland is a, a dual mode institution. Uh, we have three campuses in Toowoomba at the Fraser Coast in Springfield in Brisbane. And we started like others an open and distance learning institution, but about 40 years ago um, we started work in that area and since then our growth has mainly been in distance education. So of our 25,000 students, we now have 75% of them off campus and the other 25% spread across our three traditional bricks and mortar campuses. Um, of the 25,000 students, we've also got 5,000 international students studying off campus, <coughs> and they're distributed through 85 different countries. So we have had a strong institutional commitment to what we refer to as global learning services. And so we joined the OER initiative because it's really part of our mission and part of our history. Um, our particular interests um, are in our recent developments, so in our Open Access College, uh, which we established, and the, the director of the college, David Poole, is on his way to the meeting. He's actually flying down from Japan overnight, so it should be here at lunchtime. And uh, the other initiative that we have is the Australian Digital Futures Institute, which again is a bit like the Innovation Lab and the other initiatives that have been mentioned looking at, at changing the business models of higher education, changing pedagogies. Um, we hope to contribute to all aspects of the model. My particular interests are in open pedagogy and the ongoing evaluation of the project, but I'll have an opportunity to speak to those issues this afternoon. Thanks. And yeah, I have to say you have, you've got one or two things. I've got to change the alphabet or you have to change your name. <laughs> um, but again, another leader in the widening access to education in Australia, uh, the University of Wollongong. Yeah, and my name is Will, so I suffer the same problem personally. But I'm sure the University of Wollongong will not be changing its name. It's very proud of its name. It's uh, celebrating its 60th anniversary this year, which in a new country like Australia means it's quite old. <laughs> not as old as the University of Canterbury. And my Vice Chancellor would um, consider me remiss if I didn't first of all start by saying we're a research intensive university and that we're in the top 200, uh, <laughs> times top 200. And, um, but we've also been able to maintain a very strong reputation for teaching and learning. So we're celebrating a decade of five stars in, Australian, in the Australia's Good Universities Guide. Um, we are 30,000 students now and rapidly growing, coming through a growth phase. Um, we have seven Australian campuses and a major campus in Dubai, which has been operating for over 20 years. Our uh, international enrolments combined onshore and offshore are totaling over 10,000, so we have a strong international um, representation as well. Um, we, in 2006, got the inaugural Commonwealth University of the Year Award for Community Engagement. So it's this intersection between teaching and learning and community engagement that brings us here, I think, to the LEI Uni. Uh, we think it's very central to the university's mission to have a social responsibility to engage in open and uh, public debate and discussion, knowledge transfer, to raise our community's aspirations for lifelong learning and to provide effective pathways into formal university education. We have a very serious commitment to community engagement. Um, in the 1990s, we did pioneer open and free delivery of open content by national television broadcast. Seems so, so sweet <laughs> now, 10 to 20 years on. Um, and we are very keen to raise our profile with the internet. We have been opening content in both research and teaching for a number of years and the next logical step for us is to now offer whole courses in the open and this is at a time which coincides with the Australian Government's strong social inclusion agenda 
So our Labor government, which is really pushing social inclusion. So this, this whole initiative is timely for us in Australia. We wish to contribute, firstly, in the area of open curriculum and the logic model, but I'm also very interested, my own research is in open design and uh, open pedagogy. So we have a 10-year history of educational research and learning design at the University of Johnwell. And uh, the proposed course that we uh, are thinking about offering is not based just on content, on open content, it's based on open dialogue and debate between students, academics and community leaders and politicians. So we think this is um, a slightly different model for open, and we, but we do understand that there are sustainability issues around this design and we are hoping to learn with the um, membership of um, OER Uni about how we can do things differently from the way we did things with distance ed in the past. A new model. Thank you. During the meeting, Fakita, we had the opportunity of speaking first, so I thought it would be appropriate that we should now speak last. Um, and I'd, I'd like to invite the chair of our board of the uh, OER Foundation uh, for our looking and thank you for the Thanks, Robert. Uh, thanks, Wayne. Sorry, I was uh, listening and uh, I don't have my statement in front of me. But um, clearly, the um, OER Foundation is, uh, is absolutely um, committed to this, otherwise, we wouldn't exist. And as Phil said, when he um, did his discussion, um, we, uh, through before Wayne came to um, to work the OER Foundation, we had some issues around intellectual property and Creative Commons uh, and our licensing, and we were negotiating with their academic staff about how we might resolve these things. Um, we've been in the business of um, assessment prior learning, as Phil had indicated, for about 20 years, um, and we've been leading in that area. And it seemed unusual that the sort of advice we were getting particularly from um, legal companies, wasn't consistent with the type of philosophy and views that we had around the ownership of intellectual property and the openness and use and the ability to use that. So what we did is this way in the we um, changed the intellectual property policy and adopted the Creative Commons licence pretty much all in one go. And that drew the attention clearly of Commerce of Learning and, um, and we had a visit um, and some discussions and the opportunity arose. So from a philosophical position, it made a lot of sense then for, the, for this OER thing to, um, to germinate and for us to put a proposal together to our council that, that this is actually the right thing to do in this context worldwide. The intersection of philosophies, technologies, thinking, pedagogies and practice um, all converged about the same time and we were kind of right, right out on the edge of the boundary there and so we set the foundation up, we applied for some New Zealand money um, which we weren't successful in getting because we were too far out on the edge of the boundary um, but then we um, gained some funding internationally to, um, to launch the OER Foundation and of course the evolution of that was well, what is the role of the people in the mission of this? What are we trying to achieve here? And so it's that mission that we're now on the pathway to. And as we've brought in anchor partners, um, you know, founding partners, uh, particularly at the Basque and USQ and others as they've joined in, the whole concept has become much more, it's been fluid, but it's become much, it's focusing much more than really starting to get to the point of actually this is what we're trying to achieve here, this, I'll call it interoperability of credentials, you know, the, 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 the potential for us to operate on a global scale, um, and it's absolutely exciting, and so I'm very, very excited that this is where we're at now. Um, I have to say that sometimes I have a sleepless night uh, uh, being a tad nervous about the, the fact that this is exploding, <laughs> and we have to manage it and contain it, so you know, the people we've got here are the, are the right people in terms of logic models, process, you know, planning, action planning, project planning, <coughs> getting all these bits on the table and actually working our way through them so that we've got something that's robust, meets those quality assurance standards, uh, you know, meets the expectations of institutions, of our credentialing bodies, and most, most importantly, our students. So that will be my off the cuff, but I have written it down, but I don't have it in front of me. <laughs> Thank you. I thought off the cut version was even better. <laughs> <laughs> um, colleagues, thank you very, very much for adhering to the time restrictions. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's always tough when you, you're streaming internationally 
And I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all the people that are uh, viewing and visiting us internationally. The, uh, the, the, the chat stream folk are contributing, and our timing is just perfect. Um, just by way of uh, chat, uh, concluding this session, I, I should say that each of our founding anchor partners have actually joined as gold members. And I think that's quite significant. Uh, I should also add that we're one of the very few institutions that our gold membership is in fact a tad cheaper than our <laughs> silver membership. But the reason for that is our anchor, gold anchor partners contribute staff time, a 0.2 full-time equivalent from their own staff who will be collaborating as part of this network. So it, it is a model which scales exceptionally well. So what we will do now for the benefit of our remote participants, we will take a break for 10 minutes and reconvene local time in New Zealand at 11 a.m. Um, the virtual participants can check the world times on the agenda calendar. But during the break, if you can think of the most pressing issue that is facing your institution around the Open Education Resource University, including our remote participants because we will have a panel uh, in the next session which will explore these issues as the foundation for planning the way forward in the next sessions. So thank you very much and we'll be back online in about 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.